All right, good morning, Grace Church. If you're wondering who I am, uh, I'm Wes. I'm one of the pastors at Grace Church. I usually am over at the Cape Campus, and it's my joy to be here today. Pastor Sherry is at our central campus, and uh, they're doing a whole bunch of baptisms, and she knows some of the folks there, and so she has the honor of doing that. So we are all switching uh, campuses today. So Taylor Brown's over at the Cape, Sherry's at Central, and I'm blessed to be here with you guys uh, wow, you all really know how to worship. I was uh, I was blessed by watching you sing. At some one point, I just had to turn around and watch the joy on your faces. And uh, Jeff was up here killing it on the guitar. And uh, man, it was great to be here with you guys for this. So we uh, many years ago, Pastor Sherry and I were with Pastor George. We went to Alabama. And we were there to lead a pastor's conference. Believe it or not, the three of us, uh, the three stooges, leading this pastor's conference for several hundred pastors. And we uh, were in this place that I'd never been before. And it was in northern Alabama. And did you know that they have mountains in Alabama? We have some people from Alabama here today. Alabama contingent, say, what's up? There we go. Okay. I met them earlier. So Alabama had mountains. Who knew? Well, we were in the middle of nowhere. Now, I, I come from Kentucky. I was uh, raised in the paved part of Kentucky, but my relatives live in the hollers of Kentucky, so I know what it's like to be in a place that's called rural. Now, not rural. That's like two syllables. I'm talking rural. Everybody say rural. You got it. You caught on real quick. At the Cape, they struggle with that. So, we were in a rural part of Alabama, and I've known the camp director for this massive camp uh, since I was 13 years old. We used to uh, be together at a church in Kentucky when I was a kid, and he was a young adult, and he is the most creative human being I've ever met. His name is Lee, and Lee uses every aspect of camp to point people to the love of God. Here's what I'm talking about. We were sitting at breakfast, and I wanted to catch up with Lee. It had been several years since we talked, and we were interrupted by, I'm talking two dozen pastors and they all came to Lee in the middle of our conversation at breakfast in the cafeteria to say, how can I get a cell phone signal? I have to get a cell phone signal. They were upset. They'd never been to a place that didn't have cell service, I guess. And so they were like, the world needs me. Everyone needs me. Where can I get a signal? And Lee wasn't affected by this at all. I was starting to get annoyed. But Lee, here's what he said. He said, go outside, look up to the mountain. Stand so you get a clear, unobstructed view of the cross and the chapel there, and you'll get a signal. So here it is. He looks over to me, and he winks at me and said, I had the phone company put the cell tower in that chapel so I could say that exact line. So two dozen times, he kept saying, if you want to get a signal, go out. Get a clear, unobstructed view of the cross, and you'll be able to have conversation again. Well, friends, today we start a new series called Hearing God. I want to suggest that Lee's advice to us is good for us even here in Florida today. Because if you want to hear from God, if I want to hear from God, then, friends, we need to get a clear, unobstructed view of the cross of Jesus. And we need to position our lives there where the greatest act of love was ever done in human history, where Jesus went to the cross for our sins to set us free from sin and death so that we can have life everlasting. If we get a clear view of that and we humble ourselves and submit our lives below that cross of Jesus, then an amazing gift happens. We can hear from God because here's some good news. God still speaks today. This is not something from history I'm talking about. We're not looking at the good old days by and by. No, we're talking about right here, right now. God wants to speak to you. And that is a miracle that I need in my life. I don't know about you, but I struggle. You'll hear more about that in a minute. Today is, uh, as uh, we heard, an important day in our nation as we get ready for tomorrow, for Memorial Day. We need to stop and remember that the freedom we enjoy right now uh, came at a heavy price. I grew up at the knee of my grandpa. My, I called him Papa Lewis. He left our country one time for three years, 
and it was when he was a medic in the front lines of World War II. And we would often be out fishing together, and I would say, Papa, tell me about what happened in France or Belgium or Germany. And he would start a story, and he never could finish it without breaking down in tears because he was talking about one of his friends who had passed away. We need to remember that people gave their lives for our freedom. Today, as followers of Jesus, on this Sunday and every Sunday, and in fact, every day of our life, it is also good for our soul to remember that Jesus gave his life for our freedom, to set us free from sin and death. And that's why positioning our lives beneath the cross makes such a difference because Jesus gave his life for us. On the night he was going to be uh, betrayed, he met with his disciples, and they were freaking out because they were going to be without Jesus. They'd spent three years with him, every moment of every day, 10,000 hours, some scholars believe, and they were friends. And then they were facing this prospect. He told them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be betrayed. And before that happened, he set them down and gave them an amazing promise. John 14, 25 and 26. Look at it with me. He says, all this I've spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I said to you. Jesus makes a promise to his disciples then and now. That just as God sent Jesus to planet Earth, God would send the Holy Spirit to planet Earth to be with you and me so that we can hear from God any time that we position our lives to be able to listen. This means that if you want to hear from God, get to know the Holy Spirit. Would you say that with me? If you want to hear from God, get to know the Holy Spirit. Now turn to your neighbor and tell them that good news. Hey, if you want to hear from God, get to know the Holy Spirit. Now, Turn to your uh, second choice neighbor and tell them to in great love. All right. So this begs the question, doesn't it? This begs the question, who is the Holy Spirit? When I was growing up in church, they called the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost. And I was like, "Uh uh-uh. Do you want to get to know the Holy Ghost? No, I, I don't actually. Thank you. I like to be able to sleep at night. I don't want to know the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not scary. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is God. See, we believe in this holy mystery that God is three in one and one in three. There's no analogy that works for this perfectly uh, because we have a God that we cannot comprehend. Now, I got a D in eighth grade science, and I don't want a God that I can comprehend. I want a God that goes beyond my comprehension. So that's a good thing. You know, I can't understand God. Well, good. You know, if you could, we'd all be in trouble. So relax on that one. But just think about different images that could help us. So in my family, there are three of us in my immediate family. There's me, there's my wife, Becky, and there's our 23-year-old son, Caleb. We are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. (laughs) Far from it. We are the Olds family, though. And so when you refer to the old family, you could be referring to any one of the three of us. And when we talk about God, we could be talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You see, this is not like a a version of God, an ambassador for God. No, this is God that we're talking about. This is called the Holy Trinity. Scholars call this a holy mystery. So if you can't figure it out, you're in good company. So who is the Holy Spirit? Let's try to drill down to a definition to help us. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God living in and among disciples of Jesus today. Say that with me. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God living in and among disciples of Jesus today. So if you're a disciple of Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Let's break it down. The presence of God, the very presence of God lives in and among you. The presence of God living in and among disciples of Jesus today What does that mean? Well, if you had a cosmic GPS, a Google Maps of the cosmos, and you put in uh, the address for the Holy Spirit, please. Uh, Try this with chat GPT or AI. Where does the Holy Spirit live? Give me directions. Well, here would be the directions. There would be a little blue dot over your head. The Holy Spirit lives in you. What's the Holy Spirit's address? Is it in Orlando? No. The Holy Spirit lives in you. 
in you. That's amazing, isn't it? Look with me at this promise, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is where? Oh, boy. There it is. In you, whom you have received from God, you're not your own, the Bible says. See, you and I were bought at a price. Jesus bought you. He sought you and he bought you with his redeeming love. And out of this love, we invite the Holy Spirit. We awaken our souls to the presence of the Holy Spirit, who is God. When my son was little, uh, we would drop him off at uh, uh, the children's center, we'd go to worship. We'd say, what did you learn today? He said, well, Jesus lives in my heart. That's what I learned today. And when he said Jesus lived in his heart, he was serious. Like a little bitty Jesus <laughs> climbed in his ear, I guess, and went to his heart. Because we'd be like, where does Jesus live? He lives right there. <laughs> and it's actually not bad theology that a little Jesus would move into your life and mine. See, that's what happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit, that's what you experience when you worship as you were doing. You say, I, could, I don't have words for this. Exactly. It's the presence of God in your life. Where does Jesus live? He lives in your heart. So we're going to look at the arrival of the Holy Spirit because today is the church's birthday. Happy birthday to us. Turn to your second choice neighbor now first and say happy birthday to us. There you go. <laughs> Grace abounds. That's right. So let's go to uh, the arrival of the Holy Spirit. It's found in the book of Acts. Acts 2. A uh, guy by the name of Luke wrote about this. Fasten your seatbelts and try to imagine this in your mind's eye because this is a pretty wild scene. All right. When the, whole, when the day of Pentecost came, Luke says, they, meaning the 120 disciples who had been following Jesus, who were terrified, locked behind closed doors, they were all in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were, what's the next word? filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in, I love this word, bewilderment. Because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they said, uh, aren't these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our Native language. So what's going on is there's this festival called Pentecost going on. People from 16 different regions of the world gathered together, and all of a sudden, everybody could understand each other. Now, that would be a miracle if there were interpreters present. Um, and even then, that they would all come together as one, that's shocking. Uh, people from all over the world, and they gathered together, and they could understand each other. This is not the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues, by the way because that's it, uh, speaking a prayer language in unknown languages. They're speaking in known languages, Greek and Aramaic, Latin. They're speaking, and they could understand each other. It's a miracle. And this causes quite the scene, because those believers were terrified last time we saw them. They were hiding out. They're like, Jesus was crucified. We're next. So they were, they were filled with fear, and all of a sudden, they're out sharing in the joy of this moment, tongues of fire, wind. We know a thing about wind down here in Florida, don't we? So imagine this, but it didn't destroy. Instead, it built up. That's amazing. And here's why this matters today. Because when God speaks, lives change. Okay, you're warming up now. I'm getting ready to bless you. Are you ready? Because when God speaks, lives change. Lives change. When God speaks, brokenness is redeemed. When God speaks, families are restored. When God speaks, deep wounds are healed. When God speaks, addictions are defeated. 
When God speaks, the outcasts are seen and loved and have a voice. When God speaks, light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. When the Lord speaks, dead people walk out of their graves. When the Lord speaks, people find that they're children of God and person of worth. When God speaks, death is defeated. When God speaks, sin is defeated. When God speaks, the devil is defeated. When God speaks, you're built up with confidence. When God speaks, life, not death, wins. Can you say amen? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, we're having church up in here. I'm going to send Sherry to preach somewhere else next week, too. You guys are awesome, but let the Spirit of the Lord move in this place right now. Move in your life. Are you discouraged by something? Are you beat down by something? I got up and I saw the news the other day. They said it's a tax holiday. I was like, woohoo, for what? <laughs> Hurricane preparedness. No. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've got over the last party yet. No moss. I can't do it. No more hurricanes. But not only that, have you got up and seen some other news before? And you thought, oh, no. Not again. You got a relationship in your life and you think, oh, no. No, not again. If you got a fear in your life and you think, not again. What do we need? We need to hear from the Lord in that moment. Because when the Lord speaks, hope is renewed. When the Lord speaks, courage comes into us again in our life. So that's what's happening in this moment. The people are changed. And Peter gets up to explain what's happening to the multitudes, tens of thousands of people that are around where they were staying. Now, if I'm there at the first Pentecost, this is a problem. Like if I'm one of the disciples and Peter goes, listen, I got this, fellas. I'd be like, oh, no, 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 no. Let's get Andrew. Let's get John. Let's get John's faithful. Let's have him go up there. Peter, not you. And what happens? I mean, Peter at his best was unpredictable when Jesus was at his very side. And now he's going to get up and speak in this defining moment of history and the history of the church. But something supernatural happens. Peter gets up and preaches the first Christian sermon. And in his first sermon, 3,000 people respond to the good news of Jesus. Now, listen, as a preacher, yes, that's good. You know what that does for me? It makes me scared. Because as a preacher, I preached 3,000 sermons hoping one person would respond. Peter preaches one sermon and 3,000 respond. I mean, we preachers, we got egos. We're, we're worse off than you are. In fact, we're, we're just, we're a terrible lot. I'm preaching to myself up in here. And that's often the case. <laughs> so Peter gets up, and here's what he says. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. <laughs> this is great. The people are not drunk. As you suppose, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. No, this is what was spoken about by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, read the rest with me. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Who gets in on this? Everybody. The only thing that people could come up with when they arrive at the scene is, well, they're all drunk. And he's like, no, 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 hold on, hold on. His reasoning, it's only nine in the morning, right? They hadn't written the song five o'clock somewhere. But <laughs> he preaches the sermon, and he quotes the prophet Joel. That wasn't in my manuscript, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, he, and Joel says this, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Isn't that interesting? The last days. Do you ever feel like you're living in the last days? Yeah, me too. And from a scriptural point of view, we are. See, the arrival of Jesus is not the only time Jesus will come. 
when he came on a silent night, a holy night, when all was calm and all was bright. See, that time a lot of people missed the arrival of Jesus. But Jesus is going to come again. And nobody's going to miss it. In fact, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so this in-between time, between these two advents, from a scriptural point of view, are the end times. People a lot of times will run up to like, did you hear what happened? I think we're living in the end times. I'm like, you're right. We are. But we have been for a long time. It's okay. It's okay. The good news is we are one day closer to Jesus' arrival back here on planet Earth. And in the meantime, what God has done is through his grace has sent the Holy Spirit to us. The Holy Spirit, the Greek word for Holy Spirit is paraclete. It means one who comes alongside of you. When my papa was telling me those stories about his days in the United States Army, they would have paracletes. They would have people that came alongside them, and they would march shoulder to shoulder, and they would go into things together. They would go into battle together. And what the Lord is saying is, I'm sending you a paraclete, one who comes alongside you, and so you don't have to fight these battles that you face alone. The Lord is with you today. Take strength. The God of angels' armies is always by your side. And we begin this relationship by hearing from God, recognizing his presence through the Holy Spirit and hearing from God. Now, not to be Captain Obvious here, but hearing from God first requires that we stop and listen. Like, wow, that's profound. Well, it's news for me. Because my life can be so busy and loud that if I want to hear from God, I have to be quiet. <laughs> quiet. And sometimes it's a little scary and weird and awkward to be quiet. But if we want to get the signal to hear from God, it requires that we position our life humbly before the cross, under the cross. So we can discern what voice am I hearing. You struggle with this? I have a village of voices in my head. I call them Smurfs. <laughs> if you've read my book, you, you know all of the stuff. It's terrible. Because uh, I described the Smurf village in my head. I have trouble figuring out who is speaking. Is it one of my Smurfs or is this Jesus. And so what this requires is for me to be quiet and do something called discern. Uh, one of Sherry and I's favorite authors is Henry Nouwen. He says this about discernment. Discernment is hearing a deeper sound beneath the noise of ordinary life. See, that deeper sound is what we're listening for. It's the voice of God. Now, when Peter addressed the crowd, thankfully they were listening and they were impacted by what happened. Look with me at Acts 2.37. When the people heard this, read the rest with me. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other disciples, Brothers, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart. You see, some of these people were the same ones that 50 days earlier at Passover had most likely been in the crowd and shouted about Jesus, crucify him. And now Peter's preaching and speaking the word of God from the prophets, and some of them are like, Oh, no. Oh, no. That's who that guy was. He's the Messiah. And I was there yelling. Have you ever had a moment like that with God? Like God's goodness is explained and you're like, oh, wow. The first time that happened to me was I was in eighth grade. We were at youth group. We had communion that night. And they were talking about the story of Jesus. I had heard that many times when I was a child. And Yet something about the love of God that would give God this urge to give of his son for me just struck me. In fact, it cut me to the heart. And I was so overcome with emotion, I just sobbed on the shoulder of one of our youth counselors. When it came time to take communion, I went last because I thought I am not worthy of this kind of love in my life. Because I knew even as an eighth grader, something's wrong with me. There's something that doesn't always agree with the love of God. Like I don't always 
live that out. I don't always speak that out. Or here's the worst one for me, think it. Now, I might be kind on the outside just because I've been domesticated. <laughs> we do that with our dog, right? Be nice. But on the inside, something was wrong with me. I was cut to the heart. This has happened dozens and dozens of times in my life. And what this means is you and I need to respond when God speaks to us, even if it's a little bit painful because there's going to be some healing that comes. And so Peter tells them what to do next, verse 38. So they're cut to the heart. They say, what do we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ah. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what, what do we do to position our life? Repent to be baptized. Now, last time I was here, actually, we talked about the word repent, and it just means to turn. I shared with you I was in marching band. I had to learn how to turn. Otherwise, I would get hurt. And so what this means is turning away from our own agenda, our own sin and selfishness, turning away from Satan, even, temptation, and turning toward God. Baptism is an outward visible sign of this move in our life. So this means two things. Peter is telling us, I think today, to surrender from sin and self. What do we do? Well, to live life to the fullest, with the confidence of a child of God, it means first surrender from sin and self, and then this move, submit to God. Submit to God. So what is God inviting you to do? What is he inviting you to surrender? How is he calling you to submit? Here's why this is worth it. Because there's a promise embedded in all of this story for us today. And that is that God speaks through his promise, the Holy Spirit, and we hear through our obedience. Now, a few weeks ago, Pastor Sherry taught about obedience and obedience is, it just simply means to listen. Can you believe that? I always had obedience like, is this kind of like you shout at me, you know, obey or something. And it's not what it means. It means to listen under somebody else. It means to basically position our lives beneath the cross, get a clear signal, and then we can hear from God. <laughs> My friend Lee had it right. And friends, we are called to these moves in response to God's love. Now, I know some of you are like, listen. That was quite the trifecta of words. Surrender, submit, obey. Well, I want to tell you that it's worth it. And I discovered it again yesterday. For the last three weeks, I've been seeing a pastoral counselor, a new one in my life. His name is Brian, and uh, we meet on Saturday mornings. I went to see him because this last year has been tough. It's been full of losses. Uh, my mother-in-law even passed away 10 days after the hurricane. And then there's been relationships that have been strained, transitions that have taken place in my own life that I don't like. And all of this was awakening new fears inside of me. I thought they were new. They're actually old. And here's what I forgot about going to counseling. The first week of counseling is great. Woohoo! I'm doing something good for myself. I went and saw a counselor. The second week is terrible. Oh no, I'm so messed up. There is no hope for me. This is what was going through my head all last week. Well, thankfully, I saw my counselor again yesterday. And he said, Wes, I, I want to help you out here and I want to invite you to do something. And um, it's to recognize that not everything in the world that's broken can be fixed. And I'm like, what? I thought I was supposed to fix it. <laughs> he goes, no, some things just are. Some feelings that you have, they just are. Are you sad about everything that's been happening? I said, yeah. He said, well, then you could be sad. I was like, oh. But I don't like to be sad. I like to fix it. So he drilled down a little bit deeper. And he said, Wes, I want to invite you to something. I want to... Uh, 
invite you to let go, and then he says the word. Let go of control. I know, and I paid the guy. 100 bucks to say that to me. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know. So that was the end of our session, thankfully. He's like, you know, think about this. And I'm like, got to go by. And so I went to lunch with my wife. We were married 30 years uh, as of two weeks ago. And I was talking to my wife, Becky, which is a miracle in and of itself. Yes, thank God for that. Amen. But 30 years have taught us something and it's taught her something. So she's sitting there at lunch, and I'm explaining this whole thing. I'm like, can you believe this guy, this counselor, has told me that I have struggled with control? And she just grinned. And she winked at me, and I'm like, oh, okay, you're one of him. You know, you're with this guy. And she said, you know, honey, I want to share something with you that's become important for my life. Just for me. I'm just sharing my story, she said. She said, I found it helpful to wave the white flag of surrender often in my day and in my life. And I was like, okay, all right, the Lord's speaking here. I want to hear from God. Here it is. And she's absolutely right. You know, when an army is surrendering, they wave the white flag. And when we are cut to the heart and when we recognize that God's ways are higher than our ways and that I need the love of Jesus in my life and I need to listen to the voice of God over my, even my own voice, which is usually right, right? <laughs> If we recognize that, then the move we need to make is to wave the white flag. So the last 24 hours, that's what I've been doing. And then I had to preach this message with you, for me, and maybe some of you. Got a couple things in my life. I'm just having, I just, when I was driving over this morning, I thought, Lord, I'm, I'm waving the white flag. I'm going to wave the white flag. You are the Lord. And I want to just position my life below the cross of Jesus and there I've discovered we can hear from God and find life like we've never dreamed it possible. So today maybe you're not sure about this relationship with Jesus. And if that's you, then today could be a great day for you to surrender your life and say, yes, Jesus, I want you to be the leader, not me. I want you to lead the village in my head, take over the problems that I've got, and I'll follow you. Others of us, it's been a while, and we need to renew that commitment. Others of us have been living joyless lives. We know that the gospel is good news, but somebody forgot to tell our face. And we've been living just kind of grinding it out. That's what I've been doing. And the Lord wants to free us for joyful obedience today. Through the power of his spirit, living and moving inside of us. And so today you might want to simply pray, come Holy Spirit. You might want to come up here and kneel in a moment. And do that as a posture of humility. However the Lord is calling you to respond, I invite you to do that as we stand for prayer. So, Lord, we thank you for this birthday of the church. And we pray that, Lord, you would birth something new in us, in our lives, and that we would respond to you. Some of us have been cut to the heart by circumstances in our lives, by re relationships, by lack of finances, by grief or weariness or addictions or afflictions. And today, Lord, we want to wave the white flag. We want to surrender our life to you so that you can lead us in the way that leads to life. So, Lord, help us with our pride and egos. Forgive us, we pray. Restore us now that we might hear from you in these moments as your spirit leads us. Amen. 
So we're going to sing the song together. The altar is open if you want to come and pray or you can make your seat a place of prayer. If you want somebody to pray with you, just lift a hand and one of the team here will pray with you. Let's worship the Lord as our team leads us.